Phone is set and we are all ready to dive into yet another power pack session. Now let's make a powerful shift as we say to science. Now gone are the days when making rockets, conducting data research or even mastering astrophysics was considered a man's domain. Our next panel shines a spotlight on women scientists who are shattering gender norms and proving there is just no job a woman cannot do. These women have not only advanced India's space exploration efforts but have also redefined what is possible in science, breaking through traditional gender barriers. Their work today serves as a beacon of inspiration for countless women inspiring to forge careers in the field of science. So please join me in welcoming our next panel. We are here to hear from Dr. Annapurni Subramaniam, Director of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. We have Nigar Shaji, Project Director of ISRO's Aditya L1 mission. And Padmashri Sangamitra Bandopadzai, Director of the Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata, in conversation with Palki Sharma, Managing Editor, First Post. Good afternoon, everyone. I think you're having a very good Monday. So let's uh, bring some traumatic flashbacks from school. <laughs> How many of you have had math anxiety? <laughs> well, it happens to the best of us. Uh, when we look at a math problem and nothing makes sense anymore and we break out in a sweat, uh, you're not alone. But did you know that girls have more math anxiety than boys? And uh, I'm not the one saying this, a lot of research and a lot of studies have shown this, that uh, after grade two, boys become more confident in mathematics. And after grade three, girls tend to lose confidence in mathematics. And this is because of social conditioning. And then they begin to believe that they're not good at it and it stays with them for life. Uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, we've made giant strides uh, as a country, as a society in STEM. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. But despite role models like these, there is a glaring gender gap in STEM. So how can we bridge this gap? Uh, with me is a very, very inspiring panel. Welcome to Sri Shakti. Dr. Nigar Shaji, let's, let's start with you. You're, you're the project director for ISRO's Aditya mission. It's something that all of us, all Indians, are looking forward to. You've had an incredible journey. You said your, your father chose agriculture. You've come from, you've grown up in a small uh, town. What has this journey been like, and what sort of barriers did you face uh, while reaching this, this destination? Yeah. First of all, good morning and uh, thank you for this opportunity to be with you all. And okay, barrier, uh, if you think, because uh, I, what I'm today, I owe it to my parents. Because uh, from the childhood, my parents, uh, I can say that shielded because I was not very much aware of these uh, barriers exist at all. That's how I was brought up. So I was not, uh, when I went to school only, I was aware of such barriers or existing for women to uh, progress or have the education. And being a Muslim woman, uh, because the barriers are a little more uh, high compared to uh, the others. So, but it's my parents, so they shielded me and they have not uh, brought uh, any barrier to me. And also, my, I studied from a government school, of a girls' school, and the teachers are also uh, contributed to my this upbringing. And uh, uh, so that's how I finished my, uh, those days, the engineering was not for the girls. Very few girls were going for technology uh, studies, and most of them becoming doctors as uh, stereotypes. And I did my, and all I 
uh, owe it to my parents. And uh, I also had the opportunity to join a beautiful organization, a wonderful organization, where there are no barriers for women. So women, you can prove your uh, capability. You will be given a chance to lead. So that also was very, I, I feel I was very fortunate to have all these organizations, my parents, and that's how I uh, become. So I didn't, I'm not facing much of a barriers. So I also, I want to tell that um, because the barriers, most of the barriers are uh, because of the societal stigma, what is brought, uh, how we are brought up. So I feel the parents should be more educated as well as the girls to crash the barriers and uh, you, you break make, the barriers. You make it sound so easy. Uh, Dr. Subramaniam, uh, you were telling me earlier today that had you not been into astrophysics, you would have been a musician. Do you want to tell our audience about that? Uh, yeah, that's a good one because uh, I grew up in a, a family full of music. So my parents are professional musicians. So from morning to night, all the time at home is music. That's classical Carnatic music. So, uh, like it or not, I have to absorb everything that happens around me. So students come over, my um, mom will have classes, my dad will have classes, there will be group classes like where you, they'll be preparing for a program, etc., etc. I would be taking down notes for my mom, like you know, the notations of a new item, whether she will be just composing, so I just sit down and take the notes, etc. But then, um, I think I was quite fascinated by maths and physics at that time, and uh, I found it, uh, uh, that's my calling. And uh, uh, all the time, music was there as my plan B. But uh, sometime in my school days, physics and maths uh, took ahead of it. And then I, I decided to go with it, probably because you know, I convinced myself that I can do music side by side if I take up science and maths and physics. But if I take up music, I won't be able to go back to science. So I think that drove me towards science in particular. Yeah, Fantastic. Uh, I'm glad that plan A worked out. Uh, Dr. Bandhupadhyay, uh, I talked about math anxiety. Evidently, you had none <laughs> uh, as a child and now. You said that math was easier of all the subjects. Why do you think that a lot of girls do not share your uh, opinion on mathematics? What is it that dissuades them and what can we as a society do to change that? Uh, first of all, a very good afternoon to all of you. And thank you very much for inviting, inviting me to this session. When the invitation came and I was told that Palki Sharma will be the moderator, I said I have to go. Uh, because every evening we watch, as I said earlier on, m me and my husband, we sit down and watch your thank you. program on TV. So uh, thank you very much for having me here. About mathematics, uh, as you said, um, mathematical ability is... Uh, I think equally distributed amongst all. It's only social conditioning which turns girls away from mathematics, but I must say that it's not just girls. There are many boys also who are afraid of mathematics. So it's a general phenomena. But then more men stay on in mathematics, fewer women stay on in mathematics. It's because of a social conditioning and nothing else. For me, for example, uh, many people have asked me why I have done mathematics and physics be because these were the two subjects I was really in love with in my school days. And the answer is very simple. It's only because I could only do those two subjects and the languages and I was very bad in geography, in history, in biology, in chemistry, you name it. I was very bad. I was almost on the verge of failing those subjects in my school days because it required so much of memorization, so much of studies, while mathematics, physics was very logical one step followed from the other and if that logical sense is developed from a very young age then girls are equally good in mathematics and physics there's nothing to be afraid of only thing is when you are studying mathematics when you are studying physics have a story in your mind if you can study not just those numbers but if you think if you imagine a movie, a story at the back of your mind. For example, I sometimes uh, tell very young students that when you are studying relative velocity, for example, so that means if two, uh, two objects both are moving, how, what is the velocity of one with respect to the other? Now think of two trains moving and there's, an, there's a, a patient in one and a doctor in the other and a nurse in the patient's one. Then 
at what speed they should move so that an operation can be carried out. So that both are at rest with respect to each other. If you think of a story like that at the back of your mind, then you remember stories better than you remember, you know, dry theory. So that is how if this mathematics is taught in our schools, then uh, more through examples, more through uh, hands-on, uh, you know, experiences, experiential learning in the school days, rather than making the children learn so much of what is grown in South Africa and what is the mineral in Australia, if we have more mathematics and languages and nature in the younger days, then everybody will get the opportunity to flourish and to understand what the person loves to do. I think that's a fantastic message for all the young people out there. And you mentioned trains. We've all done those train uh, questions, two trains and two boats going upstream and downstream and somebody buying a cartload of bananas. Uh, a lot of memories coming back here. Uh, Dr. Shaji, uh, India has the highest number of graduates in STEM, more than 42%. But when it comes to women working in STEM, the number drops to 27%. So. Uh, taking forward from what, uh, what Dr. Bandupadhyay said, that at, at the school level, at the basic education level, we need to bring some changes. But in the workplace, you said that you face no barriers. But when you, when you look around you, uh, do you think that, that more needs to be done? And what sort of institutional changes uh, would, would help in changing this, this 27 to 42? Yeah. Uh, the one of the reasoning may be as uh, what you have told, the maths and physics but I do agree with uh, her, that it's nothing to do with a male or female and uh, it's a maths physics, there is a uh, fear or something is uh, being put in that is the STEM is more difficult compared to arts. So first uh, we need to break that and uh, make them make awareness among the people that uh, it's not so, it's equally, it's once again depends on one's own interest and passion in what uh, they want to do. So as uh, institution-wise, what we can do is, okay, bring awareness to, in the school level itself, so that, and uh, make, uh, introduce them to the role models and uh, many aspiring women who are currently in STEM, and bring an awareness and interest among the uh, children, and especially girls, for them, it's the, and the advantages of going to the mega, as she told, it's actually maths and physics. I also feel the same way that it's more, more easier than other subject if you understand the logics. So this is the only way we can do and uh, uh, presently we have come a long way. Compared to yesteryears, we are in a much, much better position and many, many girls are taking up and into the STEM. Once they come to, because actually if you see the education ways, uh, almost 50 percent, if you see the engineering colleges, girls are outnumbering the boys in uh, education. But only what happens is when you come to the career uh, position and uh, a leadership position, because of the family responsibilities and uh, their uh, indecis indecision among choosing career first or the family first, that pulls them back. That's why I feel uh, you see lesser people at the higher uh, leadership levels. So it's uh, slowly changing, but also this, I also wanted to say that it's uh, everybody thinks that uh, many a sessions, there will be a question asked, how do you balance family and career, right? I feel it is not the question of balancing, you integrate your career as well as your family and give the priorities as and when required and so that uh, you will not be um, back in the career and you can have the leadership roles as well. So this is quite changing. I'm sure it's going to change quite fast in the coming years. We do hope so. Dr. Subramaniam, uh, is there an implicit bias, and this is not limited to science, but I mean uh, across, across different fields, but do you in your experience also see that there's a, an implicit bias in say hiring or, or promotion or peer review or publishing studies uh, done by women? Yeah, so um, as such, I also wanted to say that I haven't explicitly faced bias, but then the bias is in terms of confidence level you will put for a woman candidate against a male candidate. So when you go to, you know, the schools, there are women, but then when you go to colleges, there are women. But when you go to even PhDs, there are a good number of women candidates. 
then you go to the PDF, the postdoctoral uh, fellowships, and then to the faculty hiring stage. The slowly dropout starts because after the masters, the, that's the age time when the uh, people go into the family mode as well, right? So then you have to, who will adjust in a couple? So that question starts coming in. And then, okay, you have a long distance relationship, but you continue with your career. At some time, you have to have children. So that time, what do you do? And then when you go to hiring stage, you have to handle your uh, family things and the time spent on the family as well as on the career. So when you have to hire on the hiring platform, when you have an application from a male candidate and a female candidate, they would have spent different times on the career because of the demand. And because of that, there may be lesser achievement from a female candidate. The hiring can, it will reflect on the hiring. But there are now, you know, the, uh, the organizations are taking cognizance of it and then pay, placing the woman candidate also at par with the male candidate, though there is no framework as such exists on that. Mm -hmm. And even if you get in, then what happens is how much time you spend on to get onto the climb the stairs up and then go move on. So there, even if you hire even female candidates, then how do you get them responsible, take the responsibility positions, and on, then on to the you know, leadership levels? But you are in yeah. a leadership position yes. now. Are you helping yes. more women climb yes. up the yes. ladder? So then we, as women who have crossed these, taken or rather climbed up these steps, have to convey this to the younger uh, faculty and give them confidence and then them say that you have to do this and climb up and put them at le leadership positions. Even at, you know, director candidates, if you look at, the, you would get n number of uh, candidates as males, then there would be one-tenth or something like that, even one female candidate coming up as a possibility for a directorship is less. But I think in the next coming decade or so, that number would increase. But I also want the authorities to have confidence in a woman who's at par with a male candidate to say that, let her take it up. Because that's the only way in which you can increase the number of female who are at the leadership positions. And that's really need to happen in STEM. Absolutely. Because I can see that me and Nigar has have shared so many stages with saying the same thing because you need to have more people in STEM, leadership positions in STEM, to showcase this, that you can do it. And it's not that it is impossible. Physics and maths are, can be, you know, tamed. They're not uh, so untamable. And then you can do and prosper as well, yeah. Fantastic. Here's another reason for young people to pick up STEM, Dr. Bandupadhyay. A STEM worker typically earns uh, two-thirds more than, than a worker of the same level in another field. And uh, enough and more research shows that this is the future of jobs and the high-paying jobs of the future will be related to science and technology and maths. Um, do you think that this, this gap in the number of men and women in this field also contributes to the gender pay gap? Um, yes, to a large extent it does, because the more women uh, are there who will decide on this pay, the more this gap will go away. Uh, and as you said, we are looking at an era where artificial intelligence, machine learning, all these are, it's already there and it's going to remain so. And that is, um, the field is ripe for women to flourish, because with more AI and ML coming into our work lives, everything. Uh, it is less dependence on muscle power. It's more dependence on intellectual power. And there women are no way behind uh, anybody. So, um, so this, the future is for women. And they will be coming up in a very big way. At present, the social system, the society is not fair. Women still have to work much harder to come up to the same level as a man. But within this unfair system, uh, we have to maneuver. The women have to maneuver. Complaining will get us nowhere. We have to get into the system, maneuver this unfair system, and try to rectify it from inside. Sounds like she Shakti. A big round of applause for this one. And, and we in the media do do our bit and I can see the change, I mean the dolls that you get in the market are no longer just princesses, there are rocket scientists and there are doctors and so on, but what can we do better to ensure uh, that, that there is enough visibility of women role models and that there is enough representation of women in science? Uh, what you're doing, this exact program, this is, this is a 
very important step. And I must say this, this awareness is there in a very big way in the country and um, uh, things are changing. I see many more women directors of institutions than I used to. Three of us are sitting here right now and many more are there. So things are changing. Um, as, as Dr. Subramaniam put, the main challenge comes because the age when the career is ready to take off is the cha age of childbearing for a woman. And to look, at, look after the family responsibilities, this is where in a very big way, as a national mission, I mean the support system has to be built in so that the woman can leave the child somewhere in very good care and do her work. Uh, you see, if you sp give 12 hours to work, you only have 12 more hours for your family. You, and you have to sleep, you have to eat. So a woman has 24 hours as anybody else. So if you give more time to work, you give less time to family. That is where the acceptance also has to come in from the society that the woman will be away, will be busy. The woman has to accept because we glorify motherhood too much. That's also a fact. We've made it so glorious that a woman who is unable to give enough time to the child or enough time as any other, as a, let's say, non-working woman, the woman herself starts feeling guilty because the society has seasoned her in such a way. I have, I have read, um, I think the Biocon founder, she had said that my baby's face is the most beautiful face in the world, but that does not mean I have to spend 24 hours looking at that face. You have to accept that, okay, I will not be able to give much, this, this much time to my family, and I am fine with that. This feeling of guilt also gets us nowhere. And that is where many women get into that leaky pipeline and they leak out. Yeah. So that is where, with women leaking out, it's not just the women who are losing. It's the entire society which is losing because women in leadership positions, in uh, important positions, that means also business. It's profitable yeah. to have more women in the boards, in the highest positions. So it makes business sense to enable women to reach that level. Absolutely, and uh, you've given us so much to think about and to talk about. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaji, Dr. Subramaniam, and Dr. Bandhupadhyay for sharing your stories and your wisdom with us, and I'm sure it will inspire a lot of young girls and boys, dare I say, to take up science. Thank you. Thank you very much.